Welcome everybody. It's so good to be with you, even if this is our last class of Seated in Heavenly Places. It's just sad, but that's the way it goes. And we really encourage you to read the book because there are so many things that we are leaving out because it's important for us to give you something that is life, that is of today. And we're taking the principles and what is in the book, but we also are taking what the Lord is speaking now. So both things go hand with hand, and this is so important that you just not be satisfied with the class, but that you really go into the depths of what I wrote in that book, because really it's a really prophetic and powerful book. So let us start our class. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for being the voice that joins together heaven and earth. And I lift up every person, Lord, that this course is not just some information, but it's a pathway for them to enter into higher realms that they really can be established and be, and be seated in heavenly places. And that what you are bringing forth from heaven will manifest in their lives. And we glorify your name, Lord. We glorify your name. Just allow the presence of the Lord to build in inside of you. So today we're going to be touching chapters 8 and 9, and this is about the Reformation. And many years ago, the Lord started to really scream out from heaven. I mean, I wrote this book like more than 20 years ago when I started to hear in heaven Reformation, and it was so loud, so loud that the Lord wanted to reform all things, so really the manifestation of everything he wants to manifest in, uh, on earth will happen in our days. So I'm going to start by reading 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them. So we're seeing here that the God of this world comes and blinds the understanding of people. So even though they have the name of the Lord, Inside, they have started to perish. And everywhere where there is unbelief, unbelief is death. And wherever there is unbelief in any area, we are allowing the spirit of death to start to creep in and to blindfold our understanding. Jesus came to destroy death. Jesus came to give us everlasting life. And he says that the purpose that the, the God of this world, the system. And when I said the God of this world, I also am encompassing the system of the world. Blinds the understanding for the very fact that the light, listen to me, so the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ will not shine. And this gospel of the glory of light is the very image of God. So Jesus did not come to preach a gospel of salvation for when we die, then we go to heaven. He preached a gospel of light, a gospel of his glory, so we can live in that light and we can live in that glory. 
The gospel has to produce the light of God when it's preached. And when it's preached from the light, it reflects the image of the Christ. So there is a big difference between just preaching a gospel to bring people to a, to a church building and to really preach the gospel of the kingdom. And this is one of the issues the Lord wants to touch in this reformation is how we preach the gospel. Because we have learned for generations and generations how to bring people into a church. But the Lord says, I came to bring and gave my life to bring people into the kingdom. He even said, go and preach the, the message of the kingdom. Go and preach the kingdom of God is here. So the Lord wants to do a reformation. And obviously it has started many, many years ago. And those that follow us will, has been in this reformation. But this reformation has not stopped. And it's not just a reformation of a form or an ideology is a reformation that really brings heaven down to earth. The problem with the system of the world and where we see this veil coming around the understanding is that little by little through the ages, the church became a system of religion in which only 10% of the people really do the work. They preach, they, they do whatever it takes, they do the prayer ministry, they go and, and take care of the souls. But 90% of the church, once the 10% uh, positions are filled, they are condemned to live a life just listening to messages for 40, 50 years in their lives. And that is not the purpose of the gospel. The purpose of the gospel is to create sons of God that can join together heaven and earth and to change the conditions of this world. And that's where the devil is so interested in veiling the God of this world, veiling the understanding. So you can only see the, the glories after you die, but that you cannot see the glories here on earth and everything that the Lord has given us. So this, uh, I, I remember being in the spirit when I started to hear so loud a scream from heaven and the Lord said to me, I am coming, I am coming with an iron rod against the religious structure of the church. Now, God loves his church and I'm not speaking about God destroying every church. I'm not speaking of that. Don't don't hear that because I believe there are churches that 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 understand the reformation and they they bring life to the people and they are training their people and they are sending their people and people are doing what they need to do but a church that does not send their people that just have the people under their control people start to perish. So the veil come when people start to perish. Even if they say, Jesus, 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 in their hearts, when there's a problem, they run to medicine, they run to, to solve the problems with the God of this world. And that is where the problem is. And little by little, these people that are trapped in the system start to perish. So the Lord is calling an awakening, an awakening into the hearts and to really revise review inside of us what parts can be perishing. And I want to read a scripture in um, Jeremiah chapter 2. And we're going to look at verse 11. And it says, Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory. My people have changed their glory. The Lord calls you to be a glorious people, but the church decided to leave their glory for what does not profit. They change their glory for something that does not profit. It does not profit to sit in a, in a pew year after year after year and lose your glory and, use, and lose the purpose of your divine call. He says, they change it for what does not profit. And, and look what this is saying here. Be astonished, O heavens, at this. And be horrified, afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. 
So the Lord speaks to the heavens. And the Lord says, because this is happening on the earth, heavens, be horrified, be astonished, be horribly afraid, be desolated heavens. So if the Lord speaking to the heavens in that way, how do you think it's happening beneath the heavens? Obviously, we're seeing this manifestation of fear. We're seeing this manifestation of horror because if the Lord is calling the heavens to be horrified because the, the people of God left their glory for something that profits not, religion profits not, everything that is from the flesh profits not, everything that comes from the spirit, everything that joins together heaven and earth, everything that comes from the light produces life, produces light. But just sitting in a system that little by little is, is, is making you more dull and more perishable. Oh heavens, be astonished, be horrified, afraid. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he plundered? Now, I want you to see this manifestation, and this is why Reformation is so important. The heavens are horrified. The messages of the earth are reflecting what heavens are producing. Horror, astonishment, desolation, death. Why? Because the system, the religious system into which the church has really bound the people, people are becoming slaves. Slaves of the system. Slaves that they don't have their own relationship with the living waters. They just go, they do what they need, they're told to do. If they have a problem, they call the pastor. Everything depends on the third person. But the living water, that connection of the living waters, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. The fountain of living waters is not in the third person. The fountain of living waters between you and God, entering, possessing the heavenly places that the Lord gave to you. But we create empty cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot contain the water. That is why every revival in history has died. Because the revival brings the glory, it's the manifestation, the Holy Spirit comes. But the vase, the building, the system is a broken cistern. And suddenly everything that came from heaven is gone to the creeks of the broken cistern. Oh, why? Why this revival stop? Because the vessels are not prepared to contain what the Lord is bringing in His glory. And they change the glory to put it into a system. And that's where you kill the living waters. And I, I believe God is making a tremendous, a powerful call because I believe even when, when the Lord is speaking to the heavens, this horrified, this astonishment, the Lord can also speak the glory again. If there is a people that rises up and tune up with the glory, that, that are tuning with these this living waters, then God speaks to the heaven and God speaks to the heaven and He says, be glorified, be, bring the righteousness, bring the glory back again and the light will shine again. We are a people that have to have ears to hear on what the Lord is saying because the page has completely changed. The Lord change everything during the lockdowns. And I remember hearing so clear 20 and something years ago that the page was going to be changed. And when the, cha the, the page was going to change, and you can read it in the book, there was going to be a silence. And that's what we live in the 2020, a silence of the church. Thousands of pastors dying, hundreds of thousand people dying because they live in a system that is not profiting, that is not calling the glory of God. 
And it's not just about, oh, let's make a conference about the glory of God. No, it's about understanding. It's about people that live in the understanding of a gospel of glory. The devil or the God of this world has blindfolded the eyes so they cannot see the light of the glory of Jesus, of the gospel of the glory. And the gospel of the glory is when you can possess everything, when you can live in divine hell, when you can trample every, every system of the world and be above everything. And I believe the Lord is speaking very, very, very powerful right now. And this is part of the reformation has to do with the understanding of what is the apostolic. So this reformation also has to do with bringing the true apostolic. Unfortunately, like 20 years ago, we started to see an apostolic movement, but it's really important to understand what is an apostolic movement and what is not an apostolic movement. When we speak about apostolic, it has to do with the light of the first day. When the Lord saw the earth in darkness covered with, with, with waters and all in, in disarray, he said, let it be light. So the essence and the substance of the apostolic is the light of Christ that comes to reorder all things so we can have a land where we have the dominion and have back what Eden has, has, was created for us to have. Jesus came to bring back, to restore what was lost and what was lost was not Jewish traditions, what was lost was the Garden of Eden. And Jesus is up to bring us back to the Garden of Eden where all the dominion has been given to the sons of God. So understanding the apostolic is very, very important because the apostolic has to have, has to bring a revelation of the Christ. The apostolic, the real apostolic movement is a movement that builds. Apostolic means to be sent and to be sent to build. To build what? The unity of the church, the, the, the holy city that is the one that will rule and is seated on the high mountain of God. The place of his rulership, the place of his throne, the place where his light shines over the earth. So apostolic has to do with understanding of the divine designs. So in order to be apostolic, you have to understand the holy city because the holy city is the design of God that rules over the earth. In order to be a true apostolic, true apostolic brings unity to the church. It's not about, I am of Apollos, I am of Paul, I have this denomination, I have this network, I am the apostle of this group and I am against the apostle of that group because we don't think the same, that's not apostolic. And we took the apostolic to just put titles on people. The Bible speaks very clear and Paul speaks very clear. Paul, apostle of Jesus Christ. When we put the name apostle before, apostle Paul, that's a title. But Jesus did not come to bring us, to give us titles, he came to give us functions. So you're never gonna read apostle so-and-so in the Bible. He called himself, I am Paul, you are Timothy. Even you call Jesus, Jesus. You don't call, oh, Messiah, Jesus, or Rabbi, Jesus, or King of Kings, Jesus. You just call him Jesus. But if you're talking to a man, you have to put a title before. That thing, it's, 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 it's nonsense and needs to change. We are brothers and sisters with different functions. And there are functions that has to do with authority and there are functions that has to do with training and functions that has to do with the prophetic and functions that has to do with taking care pastorally of people. So there are different functions. So the true apostolic understand the spiritual realm because the designs of God on how to build are in the spiritual realm. They know and they discover and they read in the books of heaven the designs that have to come to the earth. And they go, they walk hand to hand with true prophets. And when I say true prophets, I also come to this reformation because the prophetic also has been so damaged and so, so deluded and all, all we have is uh, prophets of destruction, some prophets that prophet are, are 
foretellers of the future. A true prophet has to bring you a deeper revelation of the Christ because Christ, this testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So if the testimony of Christ is the spirit of prophecy, everything that comes out from the voice of a prophet has to give you thirst and hunger to go further and further in the knowledge of Christ. Then the prophetic has been manifested because the prophetic is the voice that comes from heaven and establishes it on earth. And the apostolic comes and gives it form and gives it the building and the proper vessel so the fountains of living water will not be lost in broken cisterns. Are you hearing me? The church is not a system of slaves. Today we have a system of slaves. A system that people are in bondage, being afraid of everything. You are not a, serve, a, 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 a slave. You are not someone that is, that is born just to, to follow somebody else's fears or whatever they're teaching. So the apostolic brings back the glory of God, brings back the designs of what each person needs to be. They are gifted to see the people and, and see the designs and see what they have to bring forth in their lives so their lives can be efficient, so they can bring the light that is the image of God in their, in their midst, in their works, wherever they are. So this is why we need so much a true apostolic that really bursts forth the gifts inside of the people, that, that turns them on, that, that awakens the spirit of people. The apostolic has to do with bringing back order, the order of everything that God created the same way in the beginning, he started to restore everything. So he can put man on the medium of everything he first created. So the apostolic brings order to the living church, to the living stones, and brings the will of God to be done on earth. We need the will of God to be done on earth. We cannot go on with the will of all these conspiracies and all these governments, what they're doing. We need a people that truly can bring the kingdom down, that truly can, be, can bring the will of God down to the earth. And this is going to produce shakings, shakings in a lot of structures, shaking in the very structure of the church. Um, I believe that with all this pandemic and lockdowns and the close of so many borders and, and everything that is happening, there is a, a restructure. And thousands and millions of people that lost their churches because how many churches just were absolutely destroyed, they, they closed down or the pastor died or whatever. And they're finding that within their families, without, with the people, with their friends, they can be connected to God. It is very important that not only be connected with God, and, but not to be isolated. We have to have the sense of belonging, of belonging to a body of Christ, to the body of Christ. The Lord didn't call the church to be just a lot of people just spread out with, no, with nothing that joins them together. No, we are joined by the Spirit. We are joined by a true prophetic an apostolic ministry that finds the links. So this organization and this other organization and this other uh, person that are leading the church the way God is directing them, the true apostolic has to find the links to join together so every believer, rather you have a physical church or you don't have a physical church, you are the church, but you have to be linked. You have to belong to the family of God. That is very, very, very important. When we talk about the apostolic, we're talking about a ministry that truly creates the vessels in which the glory can be contained. And unfortunately, the vessels are so broken. And that's why it spoke is speaking about the broken cisterns, because even the bodies are so broken. And we want the glory to be contained in bodies that are absolutely a wreck. You are a vessel for his glory. And it's like the like the wineskins. 
if the oil of the Holy Spirit doesn't come and truly restore, restore the, fle the flexibility to understand new things, the flexibility to enter the new realms that the Lord is revealing, then your wineskin also breaks because you're used to a method, you're used to do things in a religious way. As the true manifestation of the apostolic has to do with the redemption of all things, as it's spoken in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, that the blood of Jesus came to restore all things, not only humanity. The earth has to be restored. All the kingdoms of this world, when I say kingdoms, I'm speaking about the animal kingdom, the kingdoms of the, of the mineral kingdom, the, all the biological uh, plant kingdom, the kingdom of the winds, everything forms part of a tremendous system of glory that God is giving us to rule over the earth. So we need people with understanding, and for this we need the light of the first day. The essence of the apostolic anointing, like I said before, is the first day light, which is the Christ that brings illumination. We need a church that is illuminated. The true apostolic movement is going to separate what comes from the human mind and what comes really from the mind of Christ. We need an apostolic movement that brings the mind of Christ back. And that's why we persevere in understanding. We persevere in bringing down everything the Lord is giving us in this ministry because we want to form vessels of light. We want to form vessels that can contain the glory, that are they're not slaves, that they're overcomers. It's like the, the book of Joel, chapter 2, is saying that the light, the in, in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the glooming day, there's going to be a people like the mist in the mountains, a people that, that no other generation has seen, that the fire will, will come and burn in front of them, that the fire will, the flames will burn behind, that you can have Eden in front of you, a people that is rising in the power of God, a people that is not afraid of whatever the government is saying. The Lord is touching a new generation. The Lord is touching a new generation that has not been contaminated with a lot of religion and fears of religion because religion has placed so many fears in the people that they don't dare to be who they are called to be. And the Lord is saying, you have a heavenly call. And this is where the apostolic comes to place. And I want, I want to read it, something that is so, so powerful in Hebrews chapter three, verse one. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, partakers of the heavenly calling. Listen, open your heart. Let the veil be ripped off your mind because you have a heavenly calling. Consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Everything that Christ is, is the essence of the apostolic. Everything that he is as the high priest, everything that he is as the king of kings, as the ruler, is the one that builds you in that heavenly calling. This generation of fire, this generation like no other generation, a generation that walks without hindering the others, but they know their calling, they're living stones, they are ready to really connect heaven and earth. And I have seen this over and over in my prayer, how people are starting to tune up with heaven and that light remains and that light remains and there's no darkness that can come against the light of the first day. Wherever there is disorganization, wherever there is chaos, wherever there is fear, wherever there is these veils where people are perishing, there is darkness. But a light is coming, a light is here. The light of the true apostolic is here and you need to tune up, tune up with life, tune up with the streams of living water that is a resurrected Christ in you. And I am calling forth this generation and I'm calling forth a generation of apostolic understanding. 
And, and it's not just to be an apostle. You can be an evangelistic with the apostolic light of Christ. You can be a prophet with the apostolic light of Christ. We are creators of a new world. The Lord gave us the ability to create things because Jesus is the light of the first day that created all things. And I believe we have that power in us. We have the power to create new things. We have the power to create new atmospheres. We have the power to create new cities, new governments, new everything. Because that light comes and brings order. The world doesn't know how to walk anymore, but we need to walk straight. It's these people that Joel saw and nothing can come against them. Even if they launch in the weapons of evil, nothing will touch them because they are of the light. And if you are of the light, if you are of the life, if you are the stream of life in this world that brings the life of Christ, nothing will touch you. And I believe as part of the apostolic is to give this to a new generation. And that is why we started to do these classes with my daughter. So you can see the fathers and the sons coming together as a power that joins together, that hits together, the old and the new coming together as a treasure in the treasures of the kingdom. You can find things of the old and you can find things of the new. So a new generation and the old generation that has tuned up comes and gives the final fist that this world needs to enter into the glory of God. So Anna, please follow us. I take this word, I take this word, I take each and every single one of these words for me, for my family, for this generation. Because one of the things that my mom and myself, we talk all the time, is that there is this need, this raising up of a generation that shines the genuine light of the resurrection of Jesus, a resurrection, a, res a generation of, of a church that knows how to establish the kingdom of God over the earth. And we are that generation. We are that generation that is tired of all of the religious, of all the oppressing systems because we do not belong there. We want that revelation that comes straight from heaven. We want that revelation that comes straight from the Father. We want that revelation that is limitless and that is going to take us in, into different dimensions. And it's, it's how it was supposed to be from the beginning it's the perfect design that god had for us in the garden of eden in this generation the church is the one that displaces any other government we are talking about a church that conquers that enters that gap and and fills it and and fights unusual battles in order to give birth to the true kingdom of god on the earth and when i speak church i want you to think i want you to think of each one of your hearts i don't want you to think about doctrine i don't want you to think about a building i don't want you to think about a multi-level system where you have to uh, bring a friend or or bring someone else in order to move forward no i'm talking about a church that is completely unveiled a church that fast seeking the presence of the Lord and his direct revelation. A church that seeks the heart of the parents and the sons and as a family of all the sons of God together. Understanding who we are as children of the resurrection of the resurrection is going to change absolutely everything because the army of God destroys all the territories of the devil everything that was in front of you that is not supposed to be there it's destroyed and you can start seeing and experience the true dimension in which you are supposed to believe in which is the, the dimension of the garden where heavens and earth are made one and we are made one with Jesus and Jesus is made one with the Father. 
there's no one who can escape the hand of this generation. There's no one that can escape the light of the Father as the ruler and as the victor. We are that generation that Isaiah saw. We are that generation whom the glory of God is born because God himself is seen in us. They are not seeing us anymore. They are seeing the light of the resurrection of Jesus. In Revelation 3, verses 17 to 21, the Lord is seeing everything from above. And he says, because you say I'm rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be jealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. We cannot continue to be a lukewarm church, apathic or, or with a lack of integrity. God is calling us to rule with him, to be that remnant that the prophet Elijah saw. The last part of this last verse that I just read. We can see Jesus knocking on our doors. And here we are not talking about the people that is not converted yet. We're talking about his church. We're talking about our hearts where he wants to be king and be one with you. These are the overcomers. These are the ones that arise to sit with him on heavenly places at the throne. We see the full manifestation of the kingdom over this rising generation. And, and it all begins with this sincere repentance in every single area of our life and giving it all to Jesus, the King of Kings. It is time to leave behind all the doctrines where we have to live in fear, where we are uh, apathetic, where we fall again and again and again with the same stone. Here and now is the King of Kings who came and is knocking at your door. He's knocking at your door right now and he wants to sit with you at the dining table. He wants to be in a meeting of love with you as close friends. He's the one that wants to take you by the hand and enter with him into the heavenly places that exist in all the different dimensions of the kingdom. Places, places where you can enter, where time does not exist, where we can see, where we can understand his kingdom. This is the life of the kingdom. This is the inheritance for those who love Jesus. 
And there is a very, very big difference between saying, oh, we are sitting in heavenly places. And another one is when you can categorically be transferred there and start living your life from there. Because once you enter, the battles that you are going to have to fight are not going to be fighting from this level below where you are right now. Because you are not going to have to be proclaiming little verses here and there. You're going to start fighting from the dimension of Christ, from the dimension of heaven. This generation of light is the one that can see everything from God's perspective and begins to have an understanding of the kingdom in the way God designed it to be. The book of Revelations, chapter 12, 7 to 10, it says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out that serpent of old called the devil and satan who deceives the whole world he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him then i heard a loud voice saying in the heaven now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. And in this battle that was carried out in heaven, the sons of God are the ones who are going to be achieving this victory. And we see this in this verse that says, and they have defeated him by means of the blood of the Lamb and the world of their testimony, and they despise their lives to the death. And it is so amazing to see and to live how this generation of, of true sons of God conquers with the power of the blood of Christ. And to achieve this, we need to have this, this deep understanding of the, the sacrifice that Jesus made. And it is in that moment where we merge with the life, where we merge with the light that comes from the blood. It is in that moment where we get together with the love that cannot be defeated because it's a love that goes beyond death. And it is that love that carries the greatest power in the universe and destroys all evil. We have already said this many, many times. The secret of shining, the secret of that true light is loving. Love bearing witness and, and bringing evidence of the reason Christ living inside of you and you living in him is a testimony of the works and the presence of God in your life. And who is this generation we're talking about? How does God choose this generation? Well, he is the one that is knocking at the door of your heart right now because he doesn't want a lukewarm, apathetic church. And he continues with his instructions in the book of Revelation 3, 8, where it says, buy my gold refined in fire. And by saying the word buy, He's telling us that we have 
to pay a price. And I am not talking about the price of salvation that we know that is given to us by grace and not by the things that we do. I am talking about what the price that you have to pay in order to be seated in heavenly places. This gold, it refers to, to the celestial wisdom, the understanding of the kingdom to enter and be purified by that fire that is going to destroy everything that remains. That fire that is also going to, to sharpen us like, like a sword that removes everything from this world. When we, when we come to Christ and, and we see the first fire and, and we fall before his holiness, now we're gonna go deeper because this fire that we're talking about is the one that is on top of the mountain and you are seeing that fire and you want to go there and you have to climb and you see the storm and it might be scary because you see the lightning and you see all this roar and you have to climb you have to climb that mountain you have to stop listening to the voice of man that is inside of you that is telling you no 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 and you have to stop all of that and listen only to the voice of God that is telling you, you are my child, you persevere, you go on top of that mountain. Oh, presence of God here. Buy my white garments. And here, like the refined gold of the previous instruction, we have to go deeper because this, these vests of salvation that he's talking about are the light of the first day that were given to us in the beginning. And Paul talks about this in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 and 4. It says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent, that is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we, who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be on cloth, but further cloth, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And these garments that Paul speaks are the heavenly room, that dwelling place that causes everything that is mortal to be absorbed by the life. It is the very presence of God that clothes the children of the kingdom. These are the same clothes that, that Adam had in paradise, which allowed him to to know that he was dressed in front of God. And these garments imply a process of search and deep love towards God. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, whoever loves me will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him because here jesus is emphasizing those who love him in those are the ones that they are going to pour their heart out those who are obedient to the word for the love of Jesus. This heavenly room that is being formed in us as we look at the glory of God and its divine provision that will transform us into his image. 
anoint your eyes with collyrium so you can see and these eye drops that are that are the waters of life would come from that intimate communion with the spirit and that wash out the eyes of our hearts are the ones that are going to allow you to start seeing things just as it happens in in to to Saul of of Tarsus in in the road of Damascus the first thing that happened there was that God closed his natural eyes why because Saul of Tarsus truly loved God he was doing things that according to him were okay but it was all wrong he had the wrong perception so God had to close his natural eyes in order for him to be able to open his eyes into the true kingdom of the light. A perception that doesn't come from men, but come directly from the revelation, the communion and the intimacy that you have with God. Luke 11, 33 to 36 says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Here Jesus is, is talking to us not about how we see things outside, but what is inside of us, what makes us perceive and see things in one way or another. And if you are in darkness, if, if you see uh, a light that, that comes from dead, that is going to dis distort all things, it is that dark glow that is going to blind you, that is going to unveil your understanding of things so that you cannot see the way God wants you to see and perceive. And this is very, very clearly explained in, in Job 10, verses 21 and 22, where it says, Before I go to the place from which I shall not return, to the land of darkness and the shadow of dead, a land as dark as darkness itself, as the shadow of death without any order, where even the light, is like darkness. The light that illuminates the, the carnal soul, the, the flesh, is death and is darkness. And what happens is that this dense darkness begins to accumulate inside of the soul and dulls our understanding so we cannot see the light of the glory of Christ. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So it is going to depend on the condition of our heart, what our eyes are going to be able to see. The pure of heart are the benign eye. This is how God sees us. God's eyes do not look at the external things. God's eyes is looking on your heart and in your motivation of doing things. And with this uh, wonderful dimension, because the reality is that God is not um, uh, shielded or dazzled by, by the things that dazzle man. And even though we may be uh, successful people on the outside or popular or like 
or have these huge congregations, he really sees our heart. He really sees our condition and he wants for us to walk with him in truth and in justice. He knows when we fast out of selfishness, when we offer uh, seeking multiplication and not to honor God with a true heart. An incredulous mind never will be able to enter spiritual dimension. A hardened and, and wounded heart that is seared, that is close, that is unsensitive to the areas of the spirit is not going to be able to enter the kingdom. And this is something that we really need to understand because a serious, serious problem that a lot of people have is that they want to find human logic to the things that they hear from God. And they, if they cannot process it, then it's just craziness and then they just refute it. God is constantly revealing new things to us, things that I did not see, nor heard, nor have entered in the heart of man. But they come from deep, deep areas of God. And what God wants is to get us out of that inner prison with all our limited thoughts and limited beliefs and stop looking for natural solutions for our problem when we have his kingdom in our midst where absolutely everything is possible. Where when, when we are babies and our spirit has just left God and we are looking for his love. Because love is the only thing that satisfies a baby. And when we start to grow and, and when we start to experience pain and when we start to experience rejection and fear and we start to put up all of these walls that protect our heart, that heart becomes of stone and it is necessary for us to reopen it. You need to reopen that heart in order to truly enter the dimensions that God has prepared for us. And this might be a painful process because we have to be faced face to face with each of those situations that made our heart be closed. But our Father and Jesus, with the chisel, with their love, are going to be removing layer by layer until we have our hearts renewed like that baby that came out of their heart when we started our life in this dimension and this child can believe all things we need to go back to that first innocence where everything was possible because the kingdom of god is limitless and the generation of light is a generation with the pure heart. So today I just invite you to, to look into, into your mind and into your heart and any areas that might be corrupted. Put them before the cross and start living in the dimension of the life and the light of the resurrection of the Christ. Amen. Amen. That was so, so powerful because literally that innocence is the opposite of fear. Innocence is actually the source of life and that's where the Lord wants us. That's where he says that we need to be like a child to enter the kingdom of God. And I want to pray for you. So Father, under the apostolic anointing that is on my life, I speak, let it be light. Let it be light, light in every area of darkness in the hearts of your people. I speak light 
I speak restoration. I speak reformation. I speak your love. I speak your boldness. I speak your fire. I speak your riches. I speak everything that comes from the kingdom of God to manifest in their lives. And it will be a shower of glory that will continue as they persevere into the rivers of life. There's going to be a shower of divine revelations that is going to reap off every bit and piece of the veil the God of this world has placed in the minds of your people. And we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of being alive in this hour. We thank you, Lord, for this divine calling, this heavenly calling that the apostle, the high priest, Jesus Christ has given us to manifest you on earth, the image, the light of the living God on earth. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us the privilege to minister to your people. And I want to bless to bless also those who have honored you with their finances, with their love to this ministry. We thank you, Lord, for their lives. We bless them, and I speak an apostolic increasing of their wealth, that there will be no shortage. As, as I read in the book of, uh, of Jeremiah, why is your people plunder? That they will not be plundered, that you will cover their lives their finances, and they will never again be plundered because understanding has entered their hearts. And we thank you, Lord, for your people. We thank you, Lord, for everything you are doing. Amen. May the Lord bless you richly.